Um, we Wooden crossbows and bone crossbows certainly work, but they are not as effective if you club something as a crossbow made out of iron, for example. But occasionally you'll get a dwarf who comes on with a high bowyery skill and he'll actually mood as a bowyer and you'll need to have the workshop. And so it's better if we just go ahead and get it created in, in case we need it down the road. Uh, we're also going to build an ashery, which makes uh, lye for other purposes later on, which I'll demonstrate. Uh, we'll build a soap makers workshop. Now, soap makers really don't use... Uh, wood, but they do use the lye from the ashery, so we'll go ahead and get him built around the same spot. And let's see, there's forge, there's magma. We did not excavate all the way down yet. That's good. Okay, let's talk about connecting this stuff up to our fortress. We punched a hole into the caverns, but we left it wide open, and the problem you're going to run into there is that you have an issue where a flying critter down in the caverns flies right up your staircase and comes right on in and makes itself at home, uh, probably killing all your dwarves in the process. That's bad. We don't want it, so we're going to avoid it. And the way we avoid it is we dig all the way down to the last level before we actually punched into the caverns. So this is the level right above the caves. And then we dig up staircases from this point. And once those staircases are dug out by our miners, we will actually go back, punch out that central staircase, and build it back in as an up-only staircase, and that will effectively seal us off from the caverns again. Um, there's nothing wrong with leaving yourself open to the caverns or building walls in the caverns. I will actually build a basically a barracks-type checkpoint at this spot, and then we'll dive a little lower, and I'll have an exit that opens up onto the caverns for limited explorations or kicking exiles out into the caverns to do cavern explorations for me. Um, Male cats make great cavern explorers, for example. It's about the only use for cats I've ever had. Uh, bunny rabbits, if you are if you don't care about bunny rabbits, you can pitch them down in the caverns. They'll graze on cave moss all day long, multiply well like rabbits, and as they expand and explore, they'll map the caverns out for you, uh, effectively making, making them into automated cavern explorers. And frankly, if they die down there, who cares? They're just rabbits. Okay, as you can see, our, our dwarves are, you know, starting to dig out these these giant lava tubes here that we've got. I think this is probably almost connected. Yeah, it's almost done. They've got a couple more levels of staircase to dig out. We'll need to connect up our access hallway so that we are ready to punch that hole once it's ready. Okay, that access tunnel there will get us to where we'll punch, we'll, where we'll be able to tap the volcano safely. Uh, this area I built up here earlier, uh, you folks might have been wondering why I widened this out. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm actually going to build my fisheries in that space. Um, fisheries are used to process the uh, raw fish that your fishermen actually catch. I will build a few of them in here just so I've got a couple of them. On hand and I will build a stockpile that only handles raw fish in this area so that the raw fish gets pulled in and doesn't rot up on the surface so the way this will work is I will build a stockpile right here at the entrance to this that only holds raw fish in barrel And the raw fish in barrels is all that stockpile will hold. And this stockpile will hold prepared fish. And then I will set it up to give to the main food storage. And so what will happen is fishermen will fish. Haulers will move their food to this uh unprepared fish stockpile my haulers also do my fish cleaning they'll come along they'll fit they'll clean the fish they'll drop the fish in this stockpile a hauler will move it from this stockpile down to the main food storage all automatically i won't have to touch this stuff ever again it's done um i simply need to set up somebody to do fishing at some point and he's already taken care of our our uh plant picker is going to get underway picking these surface crops for us and hopefully he'll 
he'll uh, snag a few of those and gain some skill in the meantime. I'm hoping to get rope reeds and fisher berries at some point in the not too distant future. And the only way we're going to do that is from the surface. So I'm going to need him to get some skill before he can actually do that properly. A lot of times when you gather plants, the success you'll succeed at doing it but your dwarf will actually produce no plants. This is, gathering is not as effective or as efficient as uh, snagging plants from your farms. So you have to watch out that you're not depending on low-skilled plant gatherers to do your, you know, uh, your food preparation, your food, uh, your food gathering, or you can run into a problem where due to low skill and low success rate and low production, your gatherers are succeeding and they're still not producing any food. Um, there's our hunter is now complaining that he can't hunt wherever he's trying. Let's see where he's gotten himself off to here. Awesome. He's pinned down onto the southwest of the wildfire. Will he make it? It's not looking good, boys and girls. Oh, and the wildfire dies off, and he can slip through the hole in the middle if he goes now, but he won't, because he's a hunter and he's stupid. Awesome. This, by the way, right here, this dwarf who was just safe, and then rather than going back someplace that was safe, he wanders back into danger again. This is why you never trust dwarves to keep themselves alive, ever. Stupid dwarf. Okay, let's see. We've got six idlers. That's way too many at this stage of the game. Our mine workers need to be doing something. Our carpenter needs to be doing something. Our peasants need to be doing something. And the best something that ever was something at this moment is going to be cutting us down a lot of trees and getting them into a wood stockpile so we don't have this problem of, oh my god, my word, wood all burned up a third time. So, we'll mark all those trees for cutting, and we'll get our haulers doing all of that job. Uh, hopefully there are enough axes left to do it. It looks like we've got some left, so we've got six haulers going off to cut trees. That's perfect. We'll go ahead and get a wood stockpile created down here where we started to build those buildings down below. They'll move the wood into the fortress where it's safe from any subsequent wildfires. Yay, us. Okay. At this point, we probably have some table and chairs. So it's time to start working on our dining room. And it's not much of a dining room, but there it is. Now, we didn't in our first episode talk about rooms. And... Rooms are kind of an unusual thing in Dwarf Fortress. I mean, when you uh, when you think about rooms, you just think about a space. And so you're looking at this room right here and you're thinking to yourself, that is a room. But it's not. Not in Dwarf Fortress. In Dwarf Fortress, in order to designate something as a room, you literally have to designate it as a room and define the space that it occupies. So we're going to make a bedroom here. We already had a bedroom, but it was just a, a collection of beds. We're actually going to make a bedroom bedroom. We're going to make it so that it occupies this entire floor because this dormitory is eventually going to become our hospital at some point in the future anyway. It will take up that whole space and we will mark it as a dormitory. In fact, we'll even name it. We'll call it hospital. Okay. What we've basically done here is said, hey, if you're a dwarf and you need a bed, you can sleep here. All the beds are available for anyone. They're not your bed. You don't get to own the bed, but you can go sleep in the bed and nobody will care. They'll get a very, very, very minor thought, bad thought, from sleeping in an unowned room, basically. But that negative thought for sleeping in an unowned room is much, much less than sleeping on cold cavern floors, in the mud, in the dirt, in the grass, in the rain, wherever. Uh, this is, uh, by definition, a vast improvement on their living arrangements so far. In fact, if I hit Shift R and pull up the room, you can see here that the decent quarters I've created is that bedroom right there on that floor. And so this is a reasonable quality for your peasants. It's not good enough for your nobles, probably, but it's good enough for any peasant who comes along. And we're by no means done with it yet. We uh, will build ourselves some beds. We will fill this up with some more space. 
we'll stick in some additional things that will raise the value of the room, and then everybody will sleep in a dormitory that's, you know, decorated for a king, and everybody will be wildly happy for it. Likewise, in our, in our dining room down here, stone tables and stone chairs individually aren't worth much, but once you jam 30 or 40 of them in this room, smooth all the stones so it's nice and pretty, add a few statues, and hey presto, you have a dining room that would make someone ignore it when their wife gets killed before their eyes and dismembers all their children at the same time. Uh, now, Print here is revealing that he actually has played Dwarf Fortress in the past, that dirty dwarf, and he asks about elves coming and attacking, and no, that, that did happen in earlier versions. There's a bug currently, and I don't know if it's affected all versions of version 34 or just the current version of 34. I haven't paid it that much mind. Right now, you can deforest the entire surface, all of your tree farms, and everything everywhere in the world, and the elves will never come and kill you because you cut too many trees. However... At some point in the future, and in very earlier and in earlier versions of Dwarf Fortress, including version 31, if you cut too many trees, the dwarves would, or the elves would send you an envoy that says, "Hey, uh, we see what you did there, and we don't like it. Uh, you're not allowed to cut trees. Only cut this many a year, or we're going to make war on you." Uh, you're going to find a lot of uh, a lot of people have different opinions about that particular thing. Some people like it. Some people hate it. Uh, Personally, you know, I'm of the opinion that, hey, I settled here. If you get your own damn trees, you bunch of dirty hippies. But the elves have uses, and therein lies the balancing act. If you can commit to their quotas in these earlier versions and you don't cut too many trees, the elves bring caged animals. And they bring caged animals of all sorts that are, that are more difficult to get or impossible to get on your map. So, for example, it's possible that the, dwar that the elves bring me caged desert scorpions. Well, I'm in the middle of a forest. I'm not ever going to see desert scorpions. But I could get caged desert scorpions from the elves, and theoretically it's possible for them to bring a breeding pair, at which point I can breed my own desert scorpions. Uh, likewise, you can get elves who bring things like giant eagles. Well, giant eagles, a breeding pair of giant eagles, not only lays eggs that, you know, are incredibly valuable and useful as food, but giant eagles can be trained to, you know, attack invaders and defend your fortress. And it's that type of utility that makes you do a balancing act. Is it worth killing the elves or, or cutting all the trees down and making war on the elves just to piss them off? Some people say yes. I say I like giant desert scorpions, so I'll put up with it for now. However, in the current version, the elves don't send envoys. There's a, there's a way to fix it if you care. Personally, I'm okay with it the way it is anyway, and I just leave it as is. Um... But be mindful of that if you should start playing a, a version down the road. It's entirely possible that in the next version that Toadie releases, hey look, the elves now send envoys again, and hey look, you cut 200 trees in the first year, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of elves with bows sitting at your door wanting to have a discussion with you that involves your entrails. Okay, we've got a fair amount of plants now and a good quantity of uh, drink for the ten dwarves that we have. We've got some nest boxes already built. Let's go ahead and get those nest boxes up and running. But before we do that, we need to make sure we've got our birds moved into the bird egg area here. Let's go ahead and get that built. Um, the reason I'm doing this before I do the nest boxes is actually fairly simple. Uh, if you make the pasture space and you move the turkeys into it, they will automatically adopt... Uh, nest boxes for themselves at some point down the road and you just need to get them in the pastures and then they will automatically take the nest boxes in that pasture for themselves um, additionally it becomes very easy then to not have to worry about your dwarves trying to move a turkey that just adopted a nest box out of the nest box and into the pasture which basically means that you, all you can do is collect the eggs this first clutch of eggs i'm really going to try not to harvest as eggs for food i'm hoping to get more turkeys uh you can actually have a population explosion of turkeys uh, a single female will lay sometimes 10 12 14 eggs i have five females you can do the math basically i'm going to have more eggs than i know what to do with and if I can get those eggs to hatch, I'll have more turkeys than I know what to do with. And about a year from now, I'm going to have all the turkeys I will probably ever really need. And they will all produce eggs, you know, en masse. So, you know, let's say half the turkeys I get, half of each 14 are female. 7 times 5 is 35 females. I embarked with 5. 35 females each laying 14 eggs. Well, you get how that works. It, it becomes very... 
uh, almost exponential very quickly. Uh, in fact, you can, you can, and it has been done, you can keep your fortress entirely on eggs. If you start your egg production early and you let some of the eggs grow up and you harvest the rest, you can, in fact, uh, fairly readily keep your fortress fed just on eggs alone. And our dwarves will come along here in a moment and start slapping some nest boxes up for the door for the birds to take. Um, at which point we'll be able to start our egg production. Right now we've just got the blueprints. There's no actual nest boxes installed. What are all our miners doing? We've got farmers and carpenters and mine workers all needing tasks. So let's go ahead and get them something to do because they're obviously bored. All right, we're ready to do our magma tap. That takes miners. Let's get that underway. Uh, first thing we do before you actually do anything else is you forbid all of the stones, gems, and materials in the magma pipes and in the magma storage areas. All of it. DBF. Forbid. Um, when you do that, what you're going to end up with is, see this, this, this boulder here on this level will actually turn a greenish color? That, that greenish color tells me that it is forbidden. You can look at See the little squiggly brackets on the day site. That tells the, the dwarves won't touch it. They won't look at it. They won't pick it up. They won't move it. It is forbidden. It is absolutely taboo for a dwarf to lay hands on that boulder right now. Now, the reason you want to forbid these boulders is because your dwarves who are working with stone will pick up stones from anywhere. And when the advancing wall of magma traps them in the magma storage chamber because they were down there fetching gems or down there fetching stones, you're going to end up with a cooked stone mason, and that's no good. So forbid all of the stones. And in addition to forbid, I'll actually show you how hide works as well. Oops. Uh, you can forbid them all manually. Here I can hit F over and over again to forbid just that one stone, for example. But DBF, uh, designate uh, building or floor, and then forbid... And then, in addition to the stuff on the stairwell, we want to make sure that everything in the magma storage room is also forbidden. Now, you say, that's great. Now I've kept my dwarves from ever noticing that that stone exists, and that's wonderful, but I can see it, and it's still there, and it's driving me nuts. Well, here's a, uh, here's a trick you can pull. There's another DB command that has hide. And what hide does is it makes it invisible to you, the player. It doesn't affect dwarves in any way. Dwarf can use a hidden item just fine. He knows it's there. You don't. It will disappear from my screen as though it doesn't exist. And since it's forbidden to the dwarves and hidden to me, these items effectively drop off the face of the map. Uh, I won't see them. The dwarves can't see them or touch them. Uh, they're not there. They don't exist. When the magma sweeps through this area, none of that stuff will actually be affected in any way. Now, if you may, you may have noticed, but in that central staircase there, there was actually a boulder there. Um, so if I go in DB and I tell it to remove hide, it will, it will show me all the hidden items. And look, right here is a boulder that we hid. Well, that boulder's in the middle of my staircases. I don't mind if they use that one. I want that unhidden. In addition, I also forbid it. So at this point, I have a boulder that I can see, but the dwarves would leave there forever. So I need to reclaim that. That's the C command up there at the top. So DBC to reclaim. And that stone right in the staircases there is now usable again and won't block up constructions. It won't get in your way. Your dwarves will use it just fine. It's never going to touch the magma, so we're safe. Now, for those of you who are just tuning in and weren't here for the first episode, but you understand how pressure works, you may never have tapped a volcano before. But what we're going to end up doing is the magma will flow in through this thing and flow all the way downstairs, and it will flow into the magma storage chamber. Now, those of you watching from home probably are going, well, hey, wait a minute, you've got a staircase there in the upper left-hand corner of this main chamber right here, and that staircase is connected right up to your forges. Oh, my God, the magma's going to flood up. Well, here's the trick. Magma, unless you pump it, never floods up. It will flood to the level that it is on, and it will never go up a cliff or staircases or any of that. It will flood only at the level it's on. So the magma will all stay down here in the chamber, and although the staircase will become unsafe to use, the magma will never actually rise up and inundate our forges, and we're safe. 
hidden and forbidden items do show up in your item count inventory. Uh, one of my folks here was asking about that. You do need to be aware that you will see forbidden items um, listed in your stocks screen. I don't know if we'll be able to see this properly here, but you'll see that I have stones, um, 300 of them laying around. Some of these are forbidden. When I get a record keeper, try to remind me and I'll show you what a forbidden one looks like here in the stocks screen. Um, we do need to get a little more booze created because we're kind of running low, but we need to get that tap done before I forget because that magma is going to take a long time to fill up that chamber. So let's go ahead and get the tap done and then we'll go back to working on some other things. Now, do be careful if you are tapping from a stone layer. Uh, if this were a layer of stone rather than soil, you can actually kill your dwarves this way. It's a hidden gotcha that you're not going to see coming. When you channel an area out, it produces a stone. If the stone falls in the magma, it creates a magma cloud. When the magma cloud hits your dwarf, guess what happens? Bad news. So, if this were a stone layer, what I would want to do instead of channeling immediately is I would want to dig it out flat and then channel the lower level separately as two separate tasks. Since this is a soil layer and the soil layer won't produce any stones to fall in the lava, it's perfectly safe for me to go ahead and channel it as is. That will get our magma tap up and running. We've, cre we've prevented anybody from doing anything on the magma storage floor, so there's, nobody, there's nothing down here that anybody's going to want, need, or go after. There'll be nobody in the danger zone, and all of this is perfectly safe. Once this magma gets up to a certain level, we'll build forges, kilns, smelters, uh, glass furnaces, and so forth on this floor. We'll set up clay collection areas and we'll have our metal and ceramics industries up and running. Uh, let's see, somebody asked if the quality of food affects moods. Yes, quality of food does affect moods, but not but food itself doesn't have a quality. When I get to the subject of kitchens, which we haven't really touched on yet, I'll show you. But basically you get uh, moods produced by the quality of the meals that you cook. So raw food is okay, uh, easy meals are a little better, normal meals are a little better than that, and there's a lavish meal that's the best you can make, basically. And then so you can make high quality booze and high quality food in a nice dining room with a nice bedroom and those things all stack up on your dwarves happiness ratings now uh, earlier I mentioned uh, dwarf monitor down here at the bottom left you're gonna see the happiness meter that dwarf monitor provides by default from the right which is ecstatic uh, there's happy content fine unhappy very unhappy and gonna stab a dude um, you want to keep your dwarves on the right-hand side of the scale, and preferably as close to ecstatic as possible. And the reason is because dwarves have some things that have incredibly powerful negative thoughts. You know, seeing your loved ones dismembered by a goblin siege, for example, or having a forgotten beast incinerate all your pets and then go rampaging through your family. Those negative thoughts all stack up, and they're very significant. If your dining room is pretty enough, and the bedrooms are awesome enough, and you've got statues everywhere, and nice doors, and nice bridges, and your dwarves are spending all their time admiring all the lovely statuary everywhere. You can actually keep a dwarf happy even when all these really terrible things are happening to him. It's kind of funny, actually. Uh, you'll see posts on Reddit and on the Bay 12, uh, Bay 12 forums about dwarves who've been kept happy while, you know, a zombie whale climbed out of the well and killed their entire family in the middle of the dining room. Okay, let's take a look and see what we've got here. We need, to, we need to expand our dormitory. We need to get our kitchens up and running. Our dining room is still underway. Oh, goody. That kid we had earlier? Yeah, he now has a job. He's now a peasant. Uh, when children grow up, as this one just did, you'll want to make sure that you get them assigned. So... If I read here, there's actually a peasant that's not part of my hauler core. First thing I need to do with him is make him a hauler. Welcome back to the land of the living, Tossid. Now pick up a shovel and get to work. Uh, one thing I didn't cover, and it's starting to affect my fortress. Let's talk about it now. You notice how I'm, I've got all these dabbling farmers here. All these people have zero. They've got a little bit of skill in farming. You might wonder why. Well, by default... Dwarf Fortress has in the orders menu, O, a, uh, a note here for harvesting, H. And you'll notice by default it's all dwarves, all harvest. That's everybody goes and picks plants out of your farms. 
that can be good in the event that your farmers all die. Your fortress doesn't just, you know, outright starve because everybody refuses to pick food. But what it does do is it, it, it slows the growth of skill of your farmers. So as long as everything's going okay, you want to have only your farmers harvesting. There's only those two options. If you want to keep everybody from harvesting, you actually can turn off food gathering. That's with F up there at the top. You'll see the difference between ignore and gather. Um... Generally speaking, I can't think of why you would want to do this, except maybe in the case of some dire emergency where you had to make sure nobody went to the farms. Uh, generally speaking, I leave all the gather tools set to gathering normally. Um, workshop orders, I'm going to set some of those. I only want them to auto loom. Dyed thread. So thread that I create might still be available for the hospital instead of automatically being created as, instead of automatically being woven into cloth. Uh, I don't want auto-collect webs on, because if I leave that on, the moment I punch a hole in the caverns while I'm making my barracks checkpoint, I'll end up with a situation where all my haulers go, Oh, look! Cobwebs! We've got to go collect those! And they all run out in the middle of the caverns and probably get slaughtered by whatever forgotten beast is roaming around out there. So by turning off auto-collect, I keep them indoors a little bit. Uh, I don't care what cloth they use. If I'm having them make cloth goods, I don't care whether it's dyed or not, so I'm not going to worry too much about whether they're using dyed cloth or any. Uh, I key those jobs up manually. They're not automatic, so I don't have to worry about it. If I'm keying it up, I want it done, and I don't care whether it's a dyed item or not. In addition to the workshop orders, one of the ones you're going to worry about is refuse. Hunters often won't return their corpses because you don't set the option for them to do so. You need to tell your dwarves to gather refuse from outside instead of ignore. Uh, when they do their butchering, they produce all kinds of miscellaneous crap that nobody cares about. I have my dwarves dump other and dump skulls. While you can make items from skulls, I've got enough stuff to make. And frankly, skulls don't add a whole lot of value to anything. If you want to make totems and, you know, and have rabbit skull totems or whatever, great. You can do it. Knock yourself out. But personally, I just have it more convenient for my dwarves to consider it one more piece of garbage they throw down the chute. Um, your mileage may vary, of course. Once I've got those basic options set, I think I'm pretty much done with the orders menu, generally. Um, with our dormitory built, we've got our our uh, brewing area is underway here. We need to get some brewing done. That'll tie up one of our haulers. Looks like our farmers need something to do. Let's see if our, uh, our uh, stockpiles here... Uh, that sound you heard, that thud, is the hunter we had earlier. He's out there fighting a jaguar as we speak. So he survived long enough, and here's the jaguar right there above the X. And he's going to track that jaguar down stealthily and shoot bolts in it until either he runs out of bolts or it dies or something comes along and kills him. Low skill hunters don't survive very well. They have a tendency to engage large animals at close range and get tr stomped on or clawed up or bitten. But a dwarf who survives a few hunting rounds ends up as a pretty nasty person with a crossbow. He will drag that corpse all the way to the nearest butcher shop and dump it off. So I will need to make sure I have a couple of things in place that I don't think I currently have. First off, I'll need a butcher, which I do have. I have lots of people set up to do butchering. But I'll also need somebody set up to do tanning, and right now I don't have anybody set up to do tanning at all. The best bet, if you don't want somebody to mood as a tanner, is to have somebody who has a much better skill, like your mason or your stone crafter, do that job. So he will get a little bit of skill as a tanner, and he'll have a better skill that he'll use instead. So for right now, uh, my farmer doesn't have anything better to do anyway, and he's, uh, he's a really high-end weaponsmith, which is a moodable skill. So he's actually better off to do this job right now for that. And we'll keep an eye on it because if he doesn't get to it quickly enough, the skin will rot when the animal is actually butchered. Um, there comes the corpse. He drops it at the butcher shop. Someone should come along here momentarily and get the corpse butchered, hopefully. Any day now. There we go. And our farmer slash weaponsmith has come along to do the butchering. If I hit T, you'll see the Jaguar corpse is tasked. That means it's being used by whatever job is active in the, in the workshop. Uh, right now, the butcher and animal job automatically gets done. If I were to go in the orders menu, in the workshop orders, and tell it, no, I don't want auto butchery, the corpse would still arrive at the butcher shop, but nobody would automatically butcher it. And I like being able to say, hey, you know what? 
you bring a corpse in, somebody needs to get on that thing before it rots. Uh, he will butcher that. Now, the good news is, is that will produce some meat. And, you know, we don't have any meat, so sure, that's good. But it'll also produce a lot of, of animal byproduct refuse. And so we'll need to talk about how to get rid of refuse and the problems that come with getting rid of animal refuse. First off, for anybody who's actually butchered an animal, cleaned a fish, etc., etc., uh, it stinks. Uh, I don't know if you've done it in real life, but it's absolutely terrible. It's, it's not a particularly pleasant, wonderful smell. Uh, blood and refuse have a particular odor that's not really pretty. Uh, if you don't believe me, feel free to go to your local supermarket, rip open, a pla rip open a fairly sanitary package of meat, and jam your face into it, and then take a deep whiff. I assure you, you won't like that smell nearly as much as you think you will. Um, when you dump refuse, refuse rots, refuse stinks. So we have to do something to prevent the stink, the miasma, from reaching our dwarves. Now there's a few ways to go about this. One is, is I could go up to the surface and I could create a, uh, a refuse stockpile out here on the surface somewhere. Stuff that rots on the surface doesn't create miasma, so it'll rot, but it won't hurt anything. Uh, the miasma effectively just blows away in the wind and you don't have to worry about it at all. I could do the sneaky trick I did with my farms. I could punch a hole above my butcher's shop, for example, like right here, above the center tile. If I were to punch a hole right there and wall it back over, that level below would be t would be treated as outside for all intents and purposes and so the rotting items in the butcher shop wouldn't stink and they could just rot there in peace that's sort of a solution i guess but i really don't like either one of those solutions one is a little bit gamey and the other one requires my dwarves to go out on the surface and frankly i like having them all underground where i can keep an eye on them so my solution is to actually create an underground refuse area to take my refuse that doesn't allow the stink to get out. And this employs a couple of metagamey sorts of things. So here our miners will come along and dig out a trench. And what we'll do is we'll create a zone called a garbage zone. It's used for the disposal, of the dumping of refuse. And we'll set that up as a garbage dump. And what will happen is if a dwarf is next to a hole when they dump their refuse. So if a dwarf is standing here, for example, when he dumps his refuse, he will aim for a hole that happens to be next to him. So he'll throw his refuse in this hole, and the, hole, the garbage will drop down the chute, and it will land here. Now, of course, I've got, you know, people doing farming right out here, so what do I do about all that? Well, as it turns out, miasma is like water, and it has a funny interaction when it comes to diagonals. Miasma doesn't go through diagonals. So this one square where all the garbage sits, and the square right above it, where the chute is, it's the chute itself is, will stink to high heaven, but people standing one diagonal away will completely fail to notice any problem whatsoever, effectively creating a stinkless garbage chute. Uh, you can use this garbage chute to dump stone and items that you don't care about. You can just throw it all in the garbage dump. At some point in the future, if you decide, hey, you know, I want to reclaim that stuff, well, what you do is you turn off this garbage dump, you dig another one over here and make it active, and w once everything over here rots down to where it stops stinking, you can go in and reclaim all the items that survive the rotting. So if you throw out a table that you don't want, later on you decide you do want the table, wait for the rot to die down so the miasma doesn't make your dwarves unhappy, and then just reclaim the table. And your dwarf will go in on the bottom floor down here, walk through the diagonal, pick up the table, and bring it right back out. Hey, presto, you just salvaged it from the dump. Now, earlier we built those nest boxes, and our dwarves have finally started getting them up and running. So here's a nest box with, you know, turkeys that have adopted it, so you can see them sitting on it. If I look at the contents of that nest box, you're going to see eggs. Right now, I don't have any stockpiles set to take eggs at all. And I want that to be the case, because I don't want my dwarves to harvest these eggs. I want these eggs to hatch. Um, with no stockpiles currently taking eggs that will happen. There's no place for them to harvest the eggs and put them so the dwarves don't get the harvesting job and everybody's happy. If your stockpile takes eggs, the way you get around this problem is you go to the nest box, you hit T to see the contents, you scroll down to the turkey egg, and you hit forbid. The little curly braces tell you that you've forbidden that egg, your dwarves won't touch it, it will hatch on its own, everybody will be happy. Uh, at this point, even if I added a stockpile that took eggs, those three batches of eggs would never get harvested ever, 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 because they're forbidden. Okay, it looks like right now the only idlers are mine workers, so let's get them working on mining. 
Here comes the advancing magma wave down our chute. Oh, here's a good thing. Remember last time I was telling you about Dig Circle? Well, I haven't used Dig Circle in this session, so it doesn't have the predefined preset for what I want. So using Dig Circle by itself doesn't actually do anything right now. All it does is sit this, uh, hit this display over and over again. So if I hit Shift F8, I'm going to get that same message over and over again in the chat window. But it's not actually going to do anything. Uh, what I want to do is the same command I was using last night. Dig circle filled 15. Uh, that command will take effect and we'll end up with a nice circular room over here built around our cursor. We'll go down. And I'll hit Shift A, F8. And my hotkey now kicks in and starts working and we can go ahead and designate all of these floors. Uh, in addition to the filled circle 15s that I've built along the way, uh, we need to fill up this section. Remember that staircase in the middle actually connects down to the caverns. That's bad. Uh, that will potentially leave us exposed to any flying critters down in the, uh, my, in, down in the caverns. They have a, a ready access. If they can fly upstairs, they can get to us. I don't want that. I'm going to fill in that hole. Make sure before you dig out that staircase, of course, that you have connection back up to the top, because if your dwarf can only stand on the staircase he's digging out, he'll fall down into the caverns with predictable, hilarious, and unpleasant results. At this point, our idle count is very low, which is where we want it. The magma is still steadily advancing down the magma pipe. You'll notice that this is not a fast process. You make sure you get it started well before you actually need the metal, because it's going to take a long time to get to where you can actually use it to make the metal. Now, it is possible to do forging without uh, magma. Uh, you can certainly make charcoal from the trees. Yeah, you know, of course, if, assuming your trees survive the wildfires. Ha ha ha. You could actually burn these logs up in a wood furnace and make them into charcoal and use the charcoal to power your smelters and your forges. Uh, the good news is you can do it. The bad news is you're going to need a lot of trees because each log, each tree converts into one unit of charcoal and it takes one unit of charcoal to power one forge operation. So to smelt a single steel bar takes one unit. Uh, or excuse me, a single iron bar. Let's not get into steel just yet. To, to make a single iron bar requires a stone, an iron ore, and a unit of fuel, a charcoal or a coal uh, coke bar. Um, in addition, then you've got a bar of iron, but a bar of iron isn't going to kill a goblin unless you fling it out of a mine cart. So then you have to take that iron bar and make it into a sword or an axe or a spear, and that takes another bar of charcoal. So to, to make an item actually takes two bars of fuel per item. And since you're going to need, you know, call it ten swords for a, unit, for a military squad, uh, you're going to need, you know, ten breastplates and ten mail shirts and ten pairs of boots and ten pairs of gauntlets and ten helmets and so forth and so on. Every one of those needs two units of fuel, which leads to a situation where you, you burn fuel at this prodigious rate. Um, magma shortcuts that process by not requiring fuel for most forge operations. There are some things that still require fuel, like making steel, but making most metal objects, making glass objects, making ceramics out of clay, uh, making uh, smelting ores down into metals. If you have a magma forge, magma smelter, magma furnace, magma kiln, you don't use any fuel to, fu to fuel those those. Uh, workshops. That actually improves your fuel usage r dramatically and allows you to survive much better underground. You don't have to embark on a volcano, uh, as I showed you folks there with Reveal, and as you can see now when I go down into the caverns, you know, this, this hole right here is actually an underground volcano, effectively. It's a magma pipe, and I could conceivably tap this, just like I tapped the volcano on the surface, uh, in order to make, um, in order to make a uh, magma chamber below this point and have my forges a little deeper than they really are. Uh, someone was asking if it would have been more efficient to make the magma tunnel one wide, and no, actually it would not. And there's, it, it sounds like you might, uh, you'll get the magma there quicker, but the problem is, is that 
when the one unit of input magma arrives here, it starts spreading out. And so you only have one spot where the magma can arrive. One unit, one tile can actually move in at a time. And what you end up with is that once it gets over to this area and it's spreading out not just across this room, but also across this room, then it spreads out even further. And now all of a sudden there's, you know, five rooms it's trying to spread out to cover. Even with the slow evaporation rate of magma, you're not transporting enough magma to the area you're trying to fill and it just never fills up. It keeps evaporating over and over again. Your forges never get underway because you don't get enough magma. We may run into that problem even with a three wide tunnel simply by virtue of how far we're having to transport the magma from its original destina original source to our destination. And if that's the case, I'll dig multiple taps. But for now, the magma's at least getting there. We'll, let, we'll watch it and see how far into the chamber it starts to get before it really starts to evaporate. Um, while it takes the magma a little longer to spread out, uh, once the magma reaches a depth of two, as it has right here, this magma, any of the magma further up the tunnel will not evaporate. This magma is effectively evaporation proof. Uh, it's only magma at level one that can evaporate. So this magma here at the front leading edge of the wave is the only part that can evaporate. Well, once it hits this chamber and it starts to spread out, more surface area means more evaporation. And that's an issue you've kind of got to deal with. So long as our idler count stays low. Ah, and here we've got our first caravan. And something I didn't do is I didn't build a depot. So our wagons are going to skip us this pass. We don't have a depot. The wagons can't access it. They just immediately skip us and move on. Uh, let's go ahead and get a depot now so we can get our trading underway. Get a broker appointed and so forth. Uh, we'll go ahead and build that out of whatever blocks happen to be available. Because as I said, that's a temporary depot. It's not a permanent situation for us. architecture is required and I don't know that I actually have an architect. This is one of those little niggling little gotchas that will come up from time to time. I don't really care about architecture if I don't have somebody who's really skilled in it already. I'll train somebody later, but for purposes of getting my fortress up and running, everybody gets architecture. I think I just turned architecture on on the dwarves who came to visit. Yay. Um, they won't actually help me build, so I'm not actually changing anything really. I've just told them that they can do architecture when they get back home. Somebody will come along momentarily and build the depot, and then the merchants will move from the edge of the map into the depot and drop their goods off. Now, that's only the first part of trading. Getting the merchants into the depot is step one. Uh, step two is you have to have your broker and your goods on site. We don't have a broker. We never appointed one. So our next step is to replace him and see if we've got anybody who's skilled at brokering. As it turns out, we don't. Um, it will sort this list when you go to replace your broker. Anybody who has skill and useful talents, whatever they might be, whether it's lying or or appraising, whatever the useful social talents are for your broker, the folks with the best skills get moved to the top of the list. So if I'm replacing my chief medical dwarf, for example, and I have somebody who is a good diagnoser, he'll appear at the top of the list. If I'm replacing my broker and I have somebody who's a great liar and a great appraiser, he appears at the top of the list. Uh, if I'm seeing my mine workers who came with me at launch and don't have any social skills to speak of because I keep them in the dark like, you know, ghouls all day long, if they're at the top of the list, nobody has relevant skills for my purposes of my fortress. So at that point, it's time to go back to Dwarf Therapist and figure out who I can reasonably sacrifice from the hauler core to use as a merchant, uh, as a broker. And you know what? We've got this dude who has absolutely no skills because he just grew up. Congratulations, Tosid. Uh, if you're not totally unsuited for it, you're going to become our broker. And as it turns out, if you look in the top 10 roles that Tosid is suited for here, uh, I'll pull up his details. Um, he's actually suited well for uh, brokering, is his number eight profession. Uh, liar is number seven, so these are, and appraiser is number two. So right then and there, Tosid makes a pretty good choice for broker that actually works out really well. Even if it didn't, Tosa doesn't have any useful skills. I need to get him to do something. Congratulations, dude. You just got promoted to broker. Now, I don't give my broker anything else to do. You will notice he has no jobs. Nothing at all. And the reason I do this is because when I want my broker to be on site for trading, I want my broker to be on site for trading. If I don't want him there, I'll give him something to do. If I take away all his tasks, he'll be there. Um, at least usually.
notice that assigning him the profession did not actually make him the broker. Uh, that's not an assignment. I simply gave him a profession title, executive-broker, so I can pick him out of the list. Uh, now he is now our broker. He will respond to uh, the trade uh, depot when it's up and running and ready to go. We'll move the bronze discs we created in the first session onto... Let's see if we got to... Oh, we need a mason, and we don't have any free masons because our mason is busy at the moment. So, hey, Tossid, you just got appointed to build our uh, depot as well. Where did you go? Tossid should be along momentarily, and he'll build himself that depot that he's now going to spend the rest of his life maintaining in terms of... Oh, I don't want you creating a uh, table, Tossid. That's not how that works. Okay, now at this point, Tossit has no job because I haven't told him that I need him. Now, you'll notice there's several commands here, and the first one we need to be important, we need to worry about is moving the goods to the depot. That's G. Go down through the list, figure out what you want to move, move it to the depot. Um, this, these weapon bins that are marked as trap components over here contain all those bronze discs we made in the first, uh, in the first episode. So those bronze discs are highly valuable trade goods. We've got some digging implements, but they happen to be in the weapon bin as well, so they'll get moved. Uh, if I had instruments or stone goods that I wanted to sell, you know, stuff encrusted with gems, this is where you migrate it to your, this is where you assign it to be migrated to your depot. Um, the dwarf uh, monitor has a, uh, a search command here. I can hit S and I can say, well, I want to search for... Oh, hell, I forgot to push the push the talk key. Sorry, guys. Let's back up a step here. Um, I had Tossed build my uh, depot and then suspended the masonry job he tried to pick up right after that so he wouldn't actually do the masonry job. I don't want him to be a mason. I want him to be a broker. Uh, he may mood as a mason down the road. That's okay. I'll make do. Uh, the search. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I have a tendency to forget the push to talk key. Please, you know pimp slap me if I do that again. Uh, when I'm bringing goods to Depot, Dwarf Monitor has a search feature that I can hit S right here and I can say, well, I want to find blocks or roasts or whatever it is I'm trying to trade. If you have a particular type of trade good you make, uh, a lot of times I make uh, harps or instruments or I'll make mugs or goblets, you can search for it directly and find it here. Um, it will not, as far as I know, find... Remember those discs are all in... Uh, those discs are all inside bins at this point, in the weapon bins, so they don't show up in the search because it's searching based on name. Whereas if I search by nuggets, there's, you know, NUG finds all the copper nuggets, block finds all the blocks regardless of what they're made out of, uh, bar will find any bars as well as barrels and cinnabar. So, you know, this, this search is purely by name, but it can help you to pick items out that you uh, want to trade that maybe you don't see them in the list right away it's a useful feature it's a convenience thing it's not going to let you trade things you wouldn't otherwise be able to trade uh, i did create a fishing spot for the fishermen i don't have any fishermen right now but this this spot up here i created a zone uh you can see the zone right here is marked for fishing i didn't actually assign anybody to use the zone but it's there for the people who were asking about the fishing zone uh, Tossed will bring up the barrel of goods that he, those two barrels of discs, our merchants and their trade and or their, uh, caravan animals will come in from the south. They'll dock at the depot and we'll be, in, we'll be able to do our trading. Uh, it takes a moment for the unloading of the merchant's goods to actually be finished. You can't trade before they're ready. Uh, if you tried, it would warn you that you can't. Make sure that you request your trader to be at the depot, otherwise he will go on break. And then he'll go sleep, and then he'll drink, and then he'll eat, and then he'll lounge around, and etc., etc. 
but he won't actually go to the trade depot and get the trading underway, which sort of defeats the purpose. Uh, eventually, he will get tired of boozing and eating and uh, whatever else he's doing going on break, and he hopefully will move right there. You can see him in the center of the depot right there, and his job will be trade at depot, and the trade option will be lit up. That's when you know you can trade. Now, just as a precaution, sometimes you're, you're, you, the, the merchants show up, and your broker is asleep, and you tell him you want him to come to the depot, and he wakes up, and then he goes and gets a drink. And after he finishes drinking, he goes for an eat, and then he's on break. And eating, drinking, and being on break is usually longer than the merchants will actually be in town, so he actually will never get to the depot, and you won't get your trade done. But there's a way around it. You can hit this B key, and it will change it to anybody can do the trade. I don't care if it's the broker. I just need to get somebody in there to do the trade. It's not likely to be as profitable. Uh, you're going to give the appraising skill ups to somebody other than your broker, but it will at least let you trade if you need to make sure you get those caravan goods. And a lot of times in those first couple of caravans, even if my broker doesn't do it, I really want to get somebody to do it. So I'll just, you know, grab the first dude I can find and have him do it. When you hit trade, it will open up this split pane window here. And on the left are all the goods that the merchants brought with them. And on the right are all the goods you brought with you, that you brought to the depot. Uh, important to note here is that there is an offer here. And what that basically says is, hey, look, I, create the, I marked this serrated bronze disc. If I hit O right now, that will give the merchant the bronze disc and ask nothing in return. Uh, this is an offer as in offer as tribute, not offer as in offer, make a buying offer. Uh, to make a buying offer, you actually hit the trade key. Uh, I'll go down through this list and we'll buy some things here. Raw crystal glass is something I'm probably not going to be able to make on site very easily. It's a good thing to go ahead and pick it up. Uh, this, I believe, is a water buffalo cage containing a water buffalo bull. Uh, that's meat on four legs. We'll take that. There's a free goose. There's a peacock. There's a couple of uh, base cages that aren't real expensive. Uh, there's some booze of various types, and I'm kind of low on booze at the moment. There's some seeds, plump helmets, sandbags. Um, we could use a bin of cloth to get us some cloth to start. Uh, leather is good to have on hand, some of that. I'll take a bin of, not just, uh, I think this, you may have noticed, but there's different types of cloth. This first bin is plant cloth, the second bin was silk cloth, and this last bin of cloth is actually animal, uh, llama, alpaca, sheep cloth. Uh, in addition, you know, you can pick up all sorts of things. You, might, you may have noticed, but these bronze discs over here are like 2500 bucks a piece. So that one bronze disc right there is more than enough to offset the value of the goods that I have already uh, marked for sale, marked for trade. Uh, we'll pick up his steel anvil. We'll buy a whole bunch of food. Um, pretty much all the food he's got on his wagon, if he had a wagon, including his plants. We'll buy the yarn and the thread. Uh, it, the good news is, is if you have a wagon dock with the depot, they actually bring a lot more goods than this. This is actually fairly low. Uh, they didn't bring much because the, the animals don't carry as much as the wagons do. The wagons carry absolutely just boatloads of gear, uh, just all kinds of stuff, everything under the sun. Uh, we have more than enough stuff here that uh, I can probably just buy the entire caravan if I want to. Uh, you'll need to make sure that your trader has a profit. Uh, this value thing here and the profit thing, traders don't trade at a loss ever, and they will be very unlikely to trade if they're not making a substantial profit relative to the value of the goods. Now, how much profit your trader needs depends on how skilled your broker is and all those little social things that brokers do. Uh, allowed weight, for those of you who are asking down here in the bottom right, is how much weight the wagons and or animals can carry away. Uh, that's important if you want to sell things like statues or mechanisms that can be very heavy. Uh, although they may be very valuable, they're also very heavy, and the wagons and animals can only carry away so much goods at once. And so if you, you know, try to sell them 100, you know, gold statues that weigh 200 pounds apiece, they're not going to have enough wagon space, enough animal space to actually carry that stuff away. Uh, if there is no difference between making one trade or multiple trades aside from uh, your own personal thing. Uh, as far as I know, the skill-ups are taken care of when you first open the trade window. They're not actually based on trades. 
uh, it may be for the social skills, you know, lying, lying, negotiating, and so forth. Uh, you can make multiple trades. We're just going to make one big trade because my my goods are few and valuable as opposed to many and low, you know, many and cheap. And I don't want to try and trade one bin of $300 cloth for one, you know, serrated bronze disc worth six times as much. Uh, that's not a particularly good trade for me. When I'm looking to skill up my broker later and I've got lots and lots of, you know, stone mugs, for example, I'll sell a few stone mugs for one item and a few stone mugs for another item and a few stone mugs for another item. And I don't actually know if that, I've never looked to see if that actually affects his skills, but typically I'll just mark as much as I need when I need it, rather than trying to mark a bunch of stuff all at once. Now, if your, once your skills get a little better for your broker, it'll actually have a little notice up here about how willing to trade the, the, or happy with the trading you've done so far the merchant is. That's based on uh, your skill of judge of intent. So uh, right now, uh, one other thing you can do, and I, I don't recommend doing it when you first start playing because you'll need to know the consequences of it, but you can mark goods on the merchant's side and then seize them directly. Uh, if you have no goods on your side marked and you have all goods on their side marked, this seized marked will be available. That's effectively going to the merchant and saying, you know what, that's a nice everything you've got there, it's mine. And you can take stuff right off the wagon. Now, it doesn't make the merchants very happy, and in the case of... Uh, merchants that belong to races other than dwarves, that can actually cause them to go to war with you in the future. In the case of dwarves, they won't go to war with you, but what will happen is that the next caravan won't have as much on it. See, caravans have multiple functions, and those functions, those functions all center around the amount of wealth the caravan arrives with and the amount of wealth that it leaves with. The more wealth that a caravan leaves with, the more profit that a caravan leaves with, the more valuable it is to you in terms of how it affects your value as a fortress. If I were to say, for example, mark all of these trade goods as offer and just hand them over, when he gets back, he's going to say, holy cow, I got back with a ton of profit, and the merchant and the mountain home is going to send me an absolute boatload of, of migrants. The next caravan is going to have a lot more gear on it, and so forth. Um, additionally, uh, profitability so for example right here i've got he's got about you know, roughly two-thirds of the value i'm trading for in terms of raw profit makes it more likely that he will accept my offer so i'm going to hit t and do the offer and hey look he liked it he took what we had and uh you'll see my items now show up in his list here in this color here these these three bronze discs is all i traded his gear does not automatically show up on our side um we haven't marked the stuff we bought from him to be used as trade goods. So although it is in the depot, it's not automatically tradable. I don't know why you'd want to buy something from him and trade it back anyway, because you're always going to trade at a loss. So repeated trading of his items back to him is actually just working against you in the long haul. Okay, now all that's really done is moved all this stuff to be in my possession. So if I hit T, now you're going to see the contents of the trade depot include not only the weapon bins that we marked for trading, but also, uh, you know, all these items that he brought himself and so forth. Now, all of those plump helmet spawn bags and so forth, that's the stuff we bought from him, and it'll get moved downstairs by the haulers here momentarily. At this point, I'm done trading. I've, I don't think there's anything left I really care about. I could buy a rope, I guess, or, you know, some of these barrels. Most of the stuff, I could buy stuff to melt down if I really wanted to, but he doesn't have a whole lot here because we we got skipped by the wagons so there's not really a whole lot here i really care about at this point i'm just gonna let the other stuff you know go and he can do his thing i'm going to tell tossit his job is done here he'll leave the depot and go back to idling uh, in the case of my broker i actually do want him to idle um as he talks to other dwarves he'll build up his social skills and social skills are pretty much what makes a broker better uh, so the, the talking that he does actually makes him better at his job. Uh, in addition, we're also going to want to make sure that we close out these things on the surface that we haven't gotten rid of. So the metalsmith forge, the smelter, the wood furnace. I need to check on the carpenter's workshop, the mason's workshop here as well. I need to see if there's anything in this still. Yeah, we've still got some furniture here. We're going to go ahead and pull that out though, because there's not much left, just some wheelbarrows. Uh, there's a few blocks here that are going to get moved down to the bar block stockpile, wherever the heck I put that, or they're being used for constructions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and clear any remaining jobs on this mason's workshop because it was just temporary. At this point, we're, we've pretty much got all of our goods uh, 
and for the most part migrated downstairs, I think. I don't think there's anything really left yet. There's some barrels still sitting around. Uh, it looks like on the wagon here, some empty barrels that need to be moved uh, to someplace a little more useful. But we don't have a furniture stockpile for them, and that's what I'm getting ready to build next. Uh, down here in the bowels of the earth, I'm going to take one of these levels that is otherwise 